Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Medina and members, this afternoon I'm here to present to you AB 369, a bill relating to the structure of salaries for CSU employees. Evidence strongly suggests that CSU is the, that that the CSU is the only California state agency that does not provide salary steps to its staff. This creates, creates an inversion in salaries where new hires are earning more than more experienced employees. Following a 1996 impasse in contract negotiations, the CSU Board of Trustees unilaterally eliminated existing employee step, salary steps, increasing ties to job performance and longevity. This has resulted in new hires earning higher salaries than existing employees who have worked in the same classification for many years. This inequity has created a $95.4 million inversion gap between the salaries of newly hired and long employed CSU staff. For two decades, the CSU has been unwilling to reinstate salary steps despite the failure of the existing salary structure and the inability of employees to earn a fair and equitable wage. AB 1231 will reinstate 5% salary steps for California State University support staff. The increase will be made annually when employees meet the standards of satisfactory performance as determined by the employee's administrators. Here with me to speak in support of AB 369 is Terry Wilson, who works at Fresno State University, and Cal Mason, who is a member of the Teamsters Local 2010 at San Diego State University, and David Bella Hawkins from the California State University Employees Union. Um, we'll have them present now. Uh, my name is Terry Wilson. I'm an 11 year employee at Fresno State. Salary steps are not raises. Raises such as general salary increases and COLAs are negotiated and have nothing to do with employees' performance. All we are asking for is parity with the other agencies and over 200,000 other state employees. I was first hired in 2007 as an administrative analyst, oversaw the budget in the engineering department, assisted with working with the Vice President for Student Affairs, which required increased staff oversight and budget responsibilities. I now run the Bulldog ID card office and Im imaging department. 13 employees working directly under me provide assistance to the administrative services department and university controller. I have an undergraduate degree with an emphasis in mathematics, science, and biology. I have two master's degrees. Despite my education, changes in my job responsibility and workloads, and consistently receiving outstanding evaluations, I have not received any merit salary increase at Fresno State in 11 years. Adding further insult, new employees are being hired in the same job classification as me and earning a higher salary. Notwithstanding my experience that is shared by thousands of other employees, CSU managers and supervisors do receive an annual merit salary increase despite criticism of a state audit released in 2017. The state audit also found that CSU management's positions grew at twice the rate of support staff with half a billion dollars per year in total compensation, far outpacing the salary of staff. Again, we are asking for is parity with other state employees. I shouldn't be financially penalized for working at the CSU, nor should new employees be hired for the same job classification that I've worked at for years and be given a higher salary. I'm asking to be fairly compensated and treated with respect. After over 20 years of inequity, I'm asking the CSU support staff be made whole again. I urge you to support AB 369. Thank you. Chair Medina, members of the committee, uh, David Bella Hawkins representing the uh, CSU Employees Union. On average, new hires for the same position on the same campus are earning over $700 more a month than employees who have been there for long-term period. So about an 18% differential between new hires and those who have been there for 10, 15 years. Terry mentioned the audit that Dr. Weber authored, a uh, state audit that was done in 2017. I just want to uh, reemphasize a couple of points. So the auditor found that mid-management level positions, so managers, supervisors grew at twice the rate, more than double the rate of, of CSU support staff, and that their compensation has now reached a half a billion dollars. The auditor concluded that the CSU could not justify the significant increase in personnel 
and in the compensation. The auditor also concluded that the CSUs that were looked at, quote, do not adequately oversee their budgets, which, quote, reduce assurances that state funds are being spent efficiently and appropriately. So we became curious about what's, what's happening to compensation funds. So we found this audit, which you have a copy of. This is from October tw uh, 2013. This was an audit that the um, uh, Elaine Howell did of uh, agencies that have outside accounts. We didn't know that the CSU had an outside account. So these are accounts that are not under the oversight or accountability of the state treasury. You'll see in 2009-10, the highlighted section, during a time when we were doing employee layoffs and furloughs and student tuition was skyrocketing, the CSU banked $682 million into an outside account that was outside the state treasury. Let me repeat that. We are laying off and furloughing employees. Student tuition is going up and the CSU profit $682 million. In uh, June 2008, you'll see a balance in these outside accounts of $1.8 billion, that's with a B. It grew to $3.7 billion 10 years later. Of that money, nearly $2 billion is discretionary ongoing funding. So for the CSU to claim that they don't have money to do this, when they have clearly profited from the abuse of these employees, we think is uh, rather hypocritical and we ask for your I vote. Good afternoon. Uh, Andrew Martinez, California State University. Uh, we, must be, we must respectfully be opposed to this measure as we were opposed to the previous ver version of the bill, uh, 1231 from last year. Uh, I would like to kind of just highlight the three reasons why we're opposed to the measure and then also talk a little bit about the, the accounts that uh, Mr. Bala Hawkins raised, and then I'll hand it over to, to John Swarbick, our Associate Vice Chancellor for Labor Relations, to talk about any questions you have about the scope of the bill. First of all, we are concerned about this bill because we believe it takes away from the CSU's ability of the Board of Trustees to manage its employees. It takes away from our collective bargaining process, and it puts it into a bill. When it comes to the accounts, the outside accounts, this was an audit item. I want to be very clear with you, the legislature gave the authority to the Board of Trustees to, to, to uh, run these accounts outside the state controller's authority. Those accounts are tied specifically to a specific obligation. So health facilities, parking, um, housing, all of them have a very specific purpose. The CSU is not in the business of running a slush fund. Just trying to understand some of the thinking about the mandate that CSU must use existing resources to pay for the ongoing 5% and what the thinking is behind that. Um, as much as uh, Mr. Martinez wants to claim that it is earmarked money, uh, and um, actually that has transitioned over time. So last year it started out as earmarked money, and about less than 45% is earmarked. Based on user fees, they stay within the fund they're required to use for those programs. We'll see what the audit says in May about the parking program, but that's the intent. If you look at the document signed by Chancellor White, you'll see an ending item called CSU Operations. That is comprised mainly of student tuition as well as salary savings. The state controller tells us, I don't know who Andrew's talking to in the state controller, they're telling us this is ongoing discretionary money. Ongoing discretionary money. So we saw that, we said, well, we don't want to put any pressure for fee increases or anything, we just want to make sure that this money, which should have been used for this purpose, is used for this purpose, and that's why we put the language in about the uh, using using the existing budget. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schwartzbrick, salary-wise, um, 2013, this man was making $223,000 a year. Five years later, he's making $269,000 a year. I've got janitors that would love to take that increase as an annual income. Frankly, I don't, we also are opposed to this measure because we don't believe this bill addresses inversion because if this bill were going to pull into place, all employees within this pool would raise 5%. You do need a satisfactory um, evaluation, but we anticipate 95 to 99% of the employees will receive a satisfactory uh, evaluation because it's on a scale of five and you need at least a three. Let me, let me say that first of all, um, the inversion issue is an issue that's being addressed in another way. And it was mentioned here, but this bill is not the solution to the inversion. Mm -hmm. First of all, that was just mentioned to show you how bad things have gotten. This bill is about restoring the merit increases that can happen for an individual. Um, 
And it's important to understand that while we give pay homage to collective bargaining, but this was done outside of collective bargaining, and that's why it's so important to understand. It would have been different if this was something that had been collectively bargained. Now, the system pays homage to collective bargaining when it's to their advantage. But when it's not to their advantage, they do what they want to do. And that's what happened in this situation. I've been bargaining these contracts since 2006. I've been the chief negotiator of multiple cycles of bargaining. Historically, what happened was that in the mid-1990s, the state decided to change the way that funds were appropriated to the CSU. Previously, the state provided money for uh, step increases, mm -hmm. and that was part of the CSU's budget. The state moved away and gave us a block amount of money and said, you CSU now decide how you spend that money. So we negotiated with our unions to move away from what generally could be called a step system, even though it, it didn't look anything like state civil service, towards a system of open ranges. Now, there was one union, CSUEU, who didn't negotiate uh, open ranges. And we went through the statutory impasse procedure under HERA. And under HERA, the administration has the ability to impose its last offer or the last offer within reasonable contemplation of the parties. So to say that it was done outside of collective bargaining is to completely ignore HERA and the terms which, under which we operate as collective bargaining. I think he did highlight a good point, which is HERA. HERA is geared towards the employer. It puts us, us, the employees, at a disadvantage because we are required to take the last, best, and final. And in this case, unilaterally, we say it unilaterally because we did not agree to it. It was the last, best, and final when we were stuck with the steps removed from our members. Now, since then, they've negotiated various other forms that have not been successful and are not to the same caliber. And that's problematic in part when the salary steps are increasing reflecting COLA, but we have a member that's worked for 53 years and is only halfway through the salary range. I don't know if working more than half a century should put you towards the max range, but I think that's highly problematic to reflect on. Actually, only six, six of our 16,000 members are in the high end of the range. There's no conversation that happens as a negotiating this. So I just want to highlight that we are talking about HERA. We're not talking about traditional collective bargaining. It is a little bit of a biased um, argument that we have to talk about collective bargaining when we're under a different system. 1992, and I'll give you any documents, we have piles of them. 1992, the CSU said, we're not going to pay your steps. It was in the contract. We took them to PERB. An appellate court ruled four years later that the CSU violated the contract, ordered the CSU to compensate 4,000 employees. At the time, it was one of the largest payouts that PERB had ever, had ever dealt with. What did CSU do that year in 1996? They knew that there was a court case coming out. In March of 1996, they unilaterally imposed and took out steps. So when the court came out with this decision in December of 1996, we couldn't apply it to the action of removing steps because it only applied to the prior action of not paying for steps and compensating our employees through 1996. So what happened was they decided to eliminate step increases, the merit step increases. Now, since then, the others have gone back and gotten merit step increases through various forms. They have refused to, bar to get, to get this, this particular group the step increases. So they're the only ones now without the 5% merit increase possibility. What we're looking at is an injustice that occurred when they decided, the administration took the merits out of the merit steps out of, out of the ability of these folks who work there. And they have been struggling ever since to bring them back, but it was not taken in the normal process, which would have been through collective bargaining. To kind of understand the structure that has happened and why this is being brought here. I would not have brought it if it had been negotiated and they lost the negotiations and it's da 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 da. They took it without negotiations. This has a lot to do with my alma mater and Fresno State. And friends that I have known for a long, long time in these kinds of positions. And when I find out that people who are making sure that Bulldog Stadium is first rate and others who are in these support staff positions uh, finding themselves having to stack shelves in 7-Eleven with a second job, while we sit in the red section 
and enjoy a wonderful experience. And when I discovered that this was the circumstance of people that I really care about and have gotten to know for a long, long time, I am in support. And I've also, on a, a purely wage and reward decision, you know, management, faculty, executives seem to do pretty well. This group of employees, I think, have been left behind. And so I'm going to uh, vote in support on this. And I sure hope it gets beyond this committee and gets to a governor who will sign it. So when I go to my next Fresno State football game, <laughs> I don't have the pangs of guilt, uh, seriously, of an, of an alum of a great university that would have support staff living the way they do. The, the reason I'm struggling with this is I have a, a principle out there that I think uh, you've, the, the, the authors acknowledged, which is that I think it's important that things that ought to be part of the collective bargaining process are part of the collective bargaining process. And I think it's really, really important that we don't create a precedent that when folks don't get what they want in the process, either on either side that they come to the legislature, because we are not suited to referee those discussions. Those are best left to the bargaining units, to the university, to have those conversations. And I, I'm glad to hear you acknowledge that, Dr. Weber. I think that's something that a view that I share. I think I heard my colleague from Santa Monica say that as well. So I think that's an important point. The flip side of that is it seems to me, from what I can gather here, and there doesn't even seem to be a, a basic agreement on the facts, but from what I gather, there's a real and significant injustice here. It seems to have persisted for two decades. It seems that there's a group of employees that are being treated differently from any other class of employees across the university, and really it's been represented to me across the state of California. And so, um, and, and everything that Dr. Weber said about this being taken away from folks outside of the collective bargaining process um, is very concerning to me. So what I'm struggling with is this general principle that I have that's a very important one to me, um, and also this discrete set of facts, which also appears to be very, very troubling to me. Um, so I wanted to, to, to thank Dr. Weber for, 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 for bringing this bill. I want to thank the, uh, the folks for coming up and testifying about it and for bringing it to our attention. I will say to the, the folks from the CSU, I consider myself one of the um, foremost proponents of higher education in the state. I think that we are dramatically underfunding higher education. Uh, I want to do everything that I can to increase funding for higher education, but it also seems to me that you are misperceiving where the legislature and the, the governor, our, our prior governor on this issue. I went back and read Governor Brown's veto message on a prior version of this bill. You saw the overwhelming vote for this a prior version of this legislation in this legislature. So clearly folks are um, upset about the current set of circumstances. Um, the, and, and, and I would you know, encourage you to go back and read that language and understand where folks are in the legislature on this. I mean, clearly it's a bipartisan issue that folks are concerned about how you're compensating these employees. And, and I would really encourage you to think about that, try and negotiate that issue because that's how it needs to be done. And when there's a refusal to negotiate, we end up in these, these type of situations. There are a lot of issues that have been raised that are not within the purview of this bill, first of all. I mean, the whole issue of trying to redesign the entire system to deal with equi equity and salaries and people being hired and administrators and all those kinds of things, that's not what this bill is about. We know that. Um, this bill is about a, a, a group of, of employees at the CSU system who had uh, a, a 5% um, step program taken away, not because they bargained for it, but it was taken away. And now the question becomes, do we go back and bargain to get it back when it was given to when it was theirs in the first place? It is nice to hear all of the conversation about everybody around, but this is really about a, a specific group of people who want to talk about having a merit salary system placed back in that other systems or other employees have in the state of California and other employees have at the CSU system that was in place. And uh, even with the comments made by the governor last year, there's been no effort to go back and have this conversation. And the governor was hesitant because he said this should be done within collective bargaining. And most of us feel that way. But they have tried and tried and tried. And so when the collective bargaining system doesn't come back to negotiate this, what do you do? Do you just say whatever, as some of the people have said, have retired and moved on and just said this system is not going to work for me? Or do you basically come to the folks who are supposedly in charge of the system, which is the legislature, and say this was taken away, we've tried our best, Everyone here probably realizes that most employee organizations, especially in the state of California, have a merit 
system built into it so that you can do assessment and you can evaluate people and they can get merit adjustments. We do that all the time up here with our employees. That doesn't exist in the CSU for this particular group. Not for the others, but for this particular group, which is the lowest paid, lowest wage individuals in the system. So what I'm asking is that we basically restore that structure back to them. Now, the issues of all the various salaries and how you're going to do equity and how you're going to have a system and you're going to take five years to evaluate this, 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 that is not what this bill is about. I want to make that very, very clear. We understood it last year. We basically recognized this was a good thing on both sides of the House, got it to the governor, and he wrote a statement because uh, he was in favor of it. But wrote a statement because he felt difficult moving into that, that system, hoping that they would be a further along in a conversation right now about how you restore these step increases, uh, this merit step that's there. That has not happened. And it may not happen and probably won't. And I understand that CSU has brought their toughest negotiator here, but I want to remind him he entered the system in 2006. This happened in 1996. So whatever he's thinking about is the history that he read about. I entered the system in 1972. So I know what they did to all the employees at one particular time and how hard it was to fight to get back the dignity of, of merit step increases, okay? And, and everyone has been able to somehow or another figure it out and get it, but they have been resistant to giving it to our lowest paid employees who often are most dedicated and more committed individuals who make the system work. So I respectfully ask for an I vote for AB 369. Madam Secretary, if you please call the roll. The motion is due passed to the Appropriations Committee. Medina? Aye. Medina, I. Choi? Aye. Choi, I. Joan Sawyer? I. Joan Sawyer, I. Bloom? Not Bloom, not voting. Gabriel? Aye. Gabriel, I. Irwin? Aye. Irwin, I. Kylie? Levine? Levine, no. Lowe? Patterson? Aye. Patterson, I. Santiago? Aye. Santiago, I. Weber? I. Weber, I. Thank you, members. 8-1, the bill is out. We'll leave it open for uh, absent members.